Hi, folks. It's Andy, the analytical preacher. You know, if I receive a question often enough as a minister, the more frequently I receive a question, the more likely it is to become a podcast topic. And today's topic is a question that I receive probably on a weekly basis, maybe multiple times on an average week. So it was at some point destined to become a podcast topic. And that question is folks basically say, can I know that I am saved or how can I know that I am saved? And it's usually prefaced by something like, I know I grew up in church and I was baptized and blah, blah, blah. They'll say, I've accepted Jesus in my heart, but how do I know that I am saved? Just a quick word of caution, the This phrase, this idea about accepting Jesus in your heart is not actually in the Bible. That's not actually scripture. That's kind of a weird way that man has come to talk about it. But when folks say to me in more biblical terms, I know that I have repented. I know that I have been baptized. I really have faith in the work of Christ on the cross. I know that's what it took to pay my debt and satisfy God. But how do I know that I'm saved? Because sometimes I worry, I become concerned. So one question is, is it possible to know that we are saved? And if it is possible, then how do we know that we are saved? We're going to start off in the book of 1 John. 1 John was written by the Apostle John, one of the original 12. You may remember that Jesus had two brothers, uh, James and John. He referred to them as the sons of thunder. Uh, It's that John that wrote this book. And John actually tells us that he wrote this letter of first John so that we would know that we have eternal life. So let me start off by reading those verses. First John chapter five. So it's the last chapter in this short letter. First John chapter five, verses 11, 12, and 13 say this. And this is the testimony that God gave us past tense that God gave us eternal life, and this life is in his Son. Whoever has the Son has life. Whoever does not have the Son of God does not have life. Then John says it, I write these things to you who believe in the name of the Son of God that you may know that you have eternal life. So he's not saying this is not for everybody. This is for those who believe in the name of the Son of God. And that's a very strong legal type argument that he's making there. We'll discuss that a little bit. Those who believe in the name of the Son of God. Those are the ones I'm speaking to, he says. And the reason is so that you may know, so that you may have certainty that you have past tense eternal life. So it's actually unbiblical for Christians to speak in a sense of, I hope that when I get there, I get in. I hope that whatever it's as a Christians, we should say, I know that because I believe in the name of the son of God, because life is in the son of God. And I have that life in me that I know that I already have. I already possess eternal life. But I had one person who said to me, as comforting as that verse is to them, They thought the most frightening verse in the Bible was in Matthew chapter 7. And they said, of course, there are verses that speak pretty directly about hell or Hades or Gehenna. But they said the verse in Matthew chapter 7, verse 21, to them was the most frightening verse. Let me read that verse and I'll explain why. Jesus said in his Sermon on the Mount, Matthew 7, 21, Not everyone who says to me, Lord, Lord, will enter the kingdom of heaven but the one who does the will of my Father who is in heaven. And they said, all I've ever heard in church was that Paul writes that we're saved by our grace through our faith, that if we need to place our faith, Jesus paid our debt for us. Jesus covered our sin for us, and God has accepted that payment. And now if we accept Christ, if we have faith that that payment has covered our sin, then we're saved. But Jesus, it said, doesn't say that here. It says, not everyone who says to me, Lord, Lord, but will enter heaven, but only those who do the will of my Father who is in heaven. And they said, that sounds counterproductive. It sounds counterintuitive. And I'm really nervous because I call Jesus my Lord, but will I say to him one day, Lord, Lord, and he won't allow me to enter the kingdom of heaven. 
And just so we understand, that's not what you say, wow, the, the Bible is 1300 pages long and there's one verse in Matthew 7. Maybe it's a little taken out of context, but that's not the only place that Christ speaks like that or that other New Testament writers speak like that. It's a bit long to read on a podcast, but many are familiar with the parable of the sheep and the goats. Jesus told this the week that he was going to be executed. So just a few days before he died, Jesus tells this parable of the sheep and the goats. To read it, you can find it in Matthew chapter 25, verses 31 to 46. And Jesus basically says, one day he'll call all the people of all the nations before him, and he'll sort out person by person. And he'll put the goats on the left, and he'll put the sheep on the right. And then he'll say to those who are on the left, you know, when I was sick or hungry, when I'd been falsely in prison or I had some type of need, you ignored me. And they say, but we didn't know it was you, Lord, or we would have pitched in because we love you. And he'll say, get away from me out into outer darkness. And then to those on the right, he'll say, and for you guys, when you saw me sick, when you saw me in need, when you saw me lacking clothing or food, when I was falsely in prison, you came to me, you helped me. And they're like, Wow, that's nice to know, but we didn't even know it was you. We were helping, and Jesus said, no, it wasn't me directly, but when you help the least of these, Jesus said, then you're helping me. You can enter into the God's glory and into the Father's heaven and so forth. But again, when people read that, they have that same question. We're saved by our faith in Christ by a belief that Jesus is the Son of God, that He is the Savior of the world. We're saved by our belief and our faith that Jesus was resurrected from the dead and He promises to resurrect us from the grave as well. So why doesn't Jesus say, I separated the nations into the sheep and into the goats and I turned to the goats and said, you didn't believe in me. Why didn't you place your faith in me? Why didn't you accept my payment for your sin? Why did he turn to, why didn't he turn to those on the right and say, but you did place your faith in me. You did accept me. You did have a belief in me of the type that could literally save your soul. Why didn't he say that? And I think Christ would answer us, but in effect, I did say that because if they had a saving faith in me, if they had a belief that would save them, They would have met those other criteria as well. Those criteria didn't save them. My work on the cross saved them. But if they are truly saved, they act more like sheep than they do goats. Jesus' half-brother, James, who was not one of the 12 disciples. There was a disciple named James, but this is a different. Jesus' half-brother, James, wrote a letter. We think it may be the first book of the New Testament that was written. And in it, James conquers this same issue. In James chapter 2, verses 14 to 17, we read this. What good is it, my brothers, if someone says he has faith but does not have works? Can that faith save him? Clearly, James is saying no. If a brother or sister is poorly clothed and lacking in daily food, and one of you says to them, go in peace, be warmed and filled, without giving them the things they need for the body, what good is that? So also, faith by itself, if it does not have works, is dead. And so we can narrow down this question. Can I know that I have eternal life? John says, yes, I actually wrote the letter of First John in the New Testament so that you could know that you do, in fact, have eternal life. Okay, then how do we know it? Well, you have to have an alive faith. You have to have a saving belief in Jesus Christ. And again, the Bible tells us sort of how we understand that, how we know that that might be the case. If we go back to the letter of First John, we're going to stay in the fifth chapter for just a moment. In First John chapter 5, verse 2 and 3, John writes this, By this we know that we love the children of God when we love God and obey his commandments. For this is the love of God that we keep his commandments and his commandments are not burdensome. Now, again, it's we hear in church all the time. I preach in church personally all the time because we cannot keep God's laws perfectly because we cannot keep the commandments perfectly, really even for a day. Jesus had to come, walk as a human, keep God's law, 
keep God's commandments perfectly for more than three straight decades. And because I can't keep his law perfectly and I can't pay for the sin that I've committed against God and against God's people, I need to rely on Jesus. I need to rely on his perfection and his obedience to the law and his sacrifice and payment for my sins. I cannot do it by obeying his commandments or helping out people in need. I cannot do it by going to church or giving money to the kingdom or anything else. But what Jesus is saying, what James is saying, and what John is saying is that if we have a saving faith, if our belief, back to our original verse, if our belief in the name of the Son of God is strong enough, is a saving faith and belief, then it changes how we think and it changes how we want to act. And now we have a desire, though it will be imperfect, we have a desire to keep God's commandments. We have a desire to help out our fellow human beings. And so Jesus can say, James can say, John can say, if you want to know if you're saved or not, ask yourself, has my thoughts, have my thoughts changed? Have my desires changed? When I came to know Jesus Christ, as Savior, did I also encounter Jesus Christ as Lord? Do I believe in the name of the Son of God? Let me throw one more set of verses out there, again from the letter of First John, but we're going to go to the first chapter, where John sort of opens this up with a really broad description that, that then he makes more and more clear as you go through chapters 2, 3, 4, and 5. I'm going to read First John chapter 1, verses 8, 9, and 10. Let me read them, and then we're going to actually break down the three different verses here. The verses say, If we say we have no sin, we deceive ourselves, and the truth is not in us. If we confess our sins, he is faithful and just to forgive us our sins and to cleanse us from all unrighteousness. If we say we have not sinned, we make him a liar and his word is not in us. That's what how John is describing it. This is one way I think that we can break this down. If we say we have no sin, we deceive ourselves and the truth is not in us. John is saying, if we say the things we do that God disagrees with. So I do this. I know I can pick up the Bible and clearly see God says, don't do that. If we say the things we do that we know God has written against, if we say that those things are not sin, or if we say that they're not our fault, then the truth is not in us. We know our sin is our fault, and we know that sin is against God's will. So if we say the things we do that I would say are sinful, that the Bible would say are sinful, if we say that those things, no, that's actually not sin, or maybe it would be if it were my fault, but it's not my fault, then the truth, John says, is not in us. Skip to that last verse. If we say we have not sinned, we make him a liar and his word is not in us. John is basically saying, and if you say you haven't done anything that God disagrees with, then you're making God out to be a liar because God flatly states in his word that all of us have done and will do things that he disagrees with. So you may say, no, I, I know God disagrees with this. But see, in this case, it was different or because it wasn't my fault. And then John says, the truth is not in you. No, you're telling me God disagrees with this, but that's not right. I haven't done anything that God would disagree with. Then he says, well, now you're just making God out to be a liar. But that verse in the middle, 1 John 1, 9, if we confess our sins, he is faithful and just to forgive us our sins and to cleanse us from all unrighteousness. You say, awesome. I know that God is faithful and just. I can always count on God to do his end, to do his part. And it says, because of that, if we confess our sins, God will forgive them and cleanse us from unrighteousness, in which case we would then know that we have eternal life. So let's drill in on this a little bit. This word for confess is what this whole verse hangs on. It's actually kind of two Greek words that are put together, homo legal. And it basically means that we're agreeing with what someone else has said or someone else has written. So if we confess our sins, it doesn't mean we're just saying, well, yes, I did that. 
It's saying, yes, I did that. But here's what God says about that sin. God said that that sin is wrong. God said that when I commit that sin, it's my fault. God says that I need to hate that sin. God says that I need to repent, turn around, walk away from that sin. God says I need to try my best to not commit that sin again. That's what God says in his word over and over and over, actually. To confess our sins is not just to say, yes, I did rob that bank. That's not a confession. A biblical confession says, yes, I did rob the bank. It was wrong to do that because God says it is wrong to steal. I need to learn to hate that sin. I have to try my level best to avoid, to turn away from that sin, which might mean digging into what causes me to do it, which might mean setting up parameters, confessing it to other people so that they can hold me accountable. Jesus says, if you know you're going to keep sinning because of your eye, then take your eye out and throw it away. So we need to get aggressive in trying to cut sin out of our life. We need to hate it. We need to change our mind about it. So that's what God is saying. If you say the stuff you're doing that appears to be wrong really isn't your fault, then you're a liar. If you say, I'm actually not doing anything wrong, now you're making God out to be a liar. But if you confess it, not just, yes, I did that, but yes, I hate that I did that. I don't want to do that anymore. I'm going to take steps to turn away from it and to cut it out of my life. Then we believe in the name of the Son of God. We're not trying to rationalize our sin. We're not trying to justify our sin. In fact, we're trying to move away from our sin. I think one powerful way to look at this is to say, when a topic comes up, smoking weed or whatever it is, do you immediately begin to justify what you want the case to be? Well, it's a natural plant that just grows, so what could possibly be wrong? Or do you immediately say, I need to go to Scripture and understand where God is pointing me on this particular issue? If you immediately begin to justify or make excuses or argue with the ministers and the whatever teachers in your church about it, then I think Jesus and James and John would say, do you have a saving faith? But if you say, I need to understand really and truly what does God want of me in this area, even if I can't fully do it because I can't perfectly keep those commandments, but I want to understand what God wants of me. And really my heart and mind say, I want to be able to do it. Paul writes in Romans 7, sometimes the things that I hate the most are still the sinful habits that I continue to do. Sometimes just thinking about how much I hate it reminds me of it and brings it up to my attention to sort of do it. Paul said, we all struggle with that, but it's, what do you really want? Have you really confessed your sins? If you have, in a biblical sense, God's faithful and just to forgive you. So this Jesus says, those will enter heaven who do the will of my Father. What is the will of God for us? Well, one, it is to repent. It's to change our mind about who God is, about the fact that Jesus should be in charge of my life, not me, and then turn around and move my life in a direction that allows Christ to take control of it. It's being baptized by immersion because it's one of the first things that Jesus tells us. Make disciples, baptizing them in the name of the Father, immersing them in the name of the Father and the Son. If you have not been baptized, again, I would question myself, do I have a saving faith if I've never really had a desire to be baptized into Jesus Christ and into his death and made part of his resurrection? Do you have a saving faith? What's the will of God that you honestly seek to understand what God wants you to do rather than trying to rationalize and justify what you want to do? What does God want you to do? Do you serve others? Because Jesus has told us over and over. Jesus set the example over and over. We should serve others. We should care for them. We should work for them. Now, when we repent, when we confess, when we try to understand what God's will really is, for our life and try to cut out the things that God disapprove of. That looks similar for all of us. When it comes to serving others and being kind, being an encourager or proclaiming the gospel, telling people about 
your Lord and Savior, Jesus Christ, that will begin to look very different person to person. So I can't really give you examples here. And I don't want you to just look at one person and go, wow, I bet that lady in my church is really saved, but I don't always do what she does. Maybe I'm not saved. It will look different person to person. The question is, do you say, since I've become a Christian, now that I study my Bible and I pray and I listen to podcasts from preachers, do I have a desire to say, yeah, you know what? I want to be a little bit less selfish this year and I want to do a few more nice things for people. Even if I have to sacrifice some of my own time, some of my own money, give up some of my own video games so that I can go do things with other people, stay off social media a little bit so that I can go engage with X. When you have that feeling of, I really just want to know in this instance, does God approve or disapprove of this? If he disapproves, you know what? I don't even want it anymore. You really begin to have that feeling when you have a saving faith, when you have a saving belief in the name of the Son of God to really help others. And then finally, what does God say? God says, be a part of a church. The Bible says, don't stop going to church. And it says in Hebrews, some people, even in the days when the Bible was still being written, some people had already stopped going to church. Others will down through time. But God says, don't stop going to church. Go. Yes, the people are imperfect, but the God you go to worship is perfect. Go to church. Serve at your church. Do classes at your church. Maybe grow in your faith so that you can teach classes at your church. Read the Bible on your own. Study the Bible on your own. Figure out some way to give to the kingdom. The Bible says that God loves a cheerful giver. There are missions, Christian missions that work with orphans, that work with foster children. There are Christian missions that rescue people from physical slavery and sexual slavery. There are medical evangelist type Christian missions that serve people through medical healing. There's churches, there's nonprofits. There's a thousand ways that you can give your time and your money back to the church. But if you say, I really don't have a desire to sing Christian songs with other Christians. I really don't have a desire to sit in a church and listen to a sermon. I really don't have a desire to give my time or my money to help others to spread the gospel or to serve orphans or widows or whatever, then again, I would say maybe you should question, do you truly have a saving faith in the name of the Son of God? To answer our question again, we can know for certain that we are saved. We do not have to wait until we die and quote unquote face judgment. Christ has paid the debt for our sins and God has already accepted the payment in full and cleaned the book off for those who have a saving faith in his son. It is true. Not everyone who says, Lord, Lord will enter the kingdom of heaven. But those who say, as I came to have that saving faith, and what Jesus Christ did on the cross to pay for my sins, it has changed my heart. It has changed my mind. And because my heart, my mind, and my desires are so different because the Holy Spirit is working that change in me, now I hate sin more than I ever did. And I love other people more than I ever did. And ultimately, over time, those actions will begin to flow out of your heart in a way that you really almost can't control. And then you can say, I know that I have eternal life. Till next time, this is Andy.